We've got two new pages, ladies and gentlemen. For those of you that did not see over on Twitter, two new pages were added last night to the Tasavesh journal, the lore book from Tasavesh. These two pages change a lot of things in the story. It does sort of throw a lot of things um, into either more focus or sort of knocks it out of focus. So we're going to do exactly what we did last week. Um, I will read them page by page and uh, we'll discuss as we go along. Hopefully there's some very interesting things here. So first and foremost, we have a report that comes from the cartel Al or Al or AI, um, whichever way I, I don't think it's AL, it's AI. Cartel AI Incident Report. This is to the Overseer Al Rilan, right? And it says, Overseer, it is with tremendous disappointment that I pass along these notes written by the hand of the heretic Al Firam. Now, I wanted to sort of focus first and foremost on this heretic Al Firam. We have believed for a very long time that... The brokers are sort of just interested in knowledge, right? That, that's all they give a fuck about. If all you care about is knowledge and wherever the evidence takes you, would you then be able to claim that someone is a heretic? Because a heretic is literally someone that goes against the orthodoxy, right? Uh, yes, to a certain extent. Um, although I don't think that it's uh, just a happy coincidence that you've got the heretic al firam and the uh abdul al hazred of the necronomicon mythos mm -hmm. i mean it's obviously borrowed from somewhere and this does give us quite distinct ways of looking at the brokers and maybe it is time to jump back into the necronomicon and sort of see if if there's tidbits that could be tied to the brokers in in one way or another my Necronomicon is actually just sitting off screen over there. I can see it right now. <laughs> <laughs> but all right, so Heretic Alfirum. Though members of the expedition had long referred to him as the Mad Scribe, none of us suspected that, this, that his eccentricities concealed unlawful beliefs, which shows there is some kind of re religiosity around the brokers they do have something that they hold sacred because if you're talking about unlawful beliefs that's very similar to what yeah. you would have found in the you know 1600s the 1700s even earlier I um, it's time for a crusade boys let's go <laughs> yeah where you know the protestants are fucking over the catholics or the catholics rather is fucking over the protestants uh because of unlawful beliefs uh katrina stars is asking what is the necronomicon it's the it's a book that was written by, I believe, H.P. Lovecraft, or is it a collection of his works? Tie-in. Uh, it's a uh, in-universe in mythos book. Uh, it's difficult to understand the H.P. Lovecraft universe, just to be clear. I believe the last time I checked, it's something like over 400 writers have contributed to the H.P. Lovecraft universe since its inception with sometimes small books that have almost nothing to do with the Lovecraft universe, and sometimes books that's completely in the Lovecraft universe. It, it, it's a difficult universe to understand at the, at the best of fucking times. It's a difficult universe to understand. Yeah. The Necronomicon is a collection, I, I guess. So I've not read the Necronomicon. I've read passages of it, like chapters of it, but I haven't read the entirety of it. But if so the which chapters Necronomicon are, have you read then? Because there are two. No, no, I think I've only read the first one. I've I've only only in my uh, sort of looking for evidence of the old gods. So I would right, I would okay. look for specific passages that only talk about the outer gods, the elder gods, the elder ones, you know, so I was doing it in research of the old gods. So I've never done it just for the sake of doing it. I've read his call right. uh, Call of Cthulhu. That one I've read. Yeah. What a fucking difficult read, but I have read it. <laughs> it's um, definitely a difficult read, but it's the same <laughs> of anything at the time, right? Uh, like even Tolkien's works are yes. difficult to read at some times. <laughs> um, but yeah, there are two actually two different versions of the Necronomicon. Um, they're not like iterations; they are completely yeah. different versions. Uh, one is the like in-universe mythos kind of an extra story. Mm -hmm. The one I have is the one they refer to, the one written by uh, the Mad Arab Abdul Al Hazred. Uh, oh, yeah. under the synonym of Simon the Sorcerer. 
Okay. Um, but it's got all the sigils, it's got all the rituals, it's got everything yeah. uh, in there. Like it's the actual kind of like um, reference book, so to speak. Yeah, I would say at this point, there's very few things that I wouldn't loosely understand about the H.P. Lovecraft universe, basically because a lot of my research in World of Warcraft often takes me to H.P. Lovecraft and to his Obviously, universe yeah. and to the, the the god structures that he has in his universe. And considering the amount of incredible influence H.P. Lovecraft has had on games in general, like the sheer amount of games that have come into fruition based loosely on something from H.P. Lovecraft's universe, you'd be remiss not to read at least yeah, some things sure. of H.P. Lovecraft. But it is difficult books to read. I'll, I'll just be very honest. This is why I've never really, outside of Call of Cthulhu, I've never really read any of his other books from start to finish. Because they take a long Shadow time to Rinsmith read. Shadow of is definitely a very good one. I would I would definitely recommend H.P. Lovecraft over like The Great Gatsby, for example. Oh, yeah, that yeah. was a fucking plank of wood to bash your head against to try and read. The movie was uh, not better. No. <laughs> <laughs> Lovecraft is significantly easier to read than yeah. <laughs> uh, stuff of that nature. The reason it's it's kind of, people struggle to deal with the Lovecraft mythos, Lovecraft story, and keep it kind of coherent is that it's not meant to be kept coherent. No. Uh, it deals with uh, ideas and kind of themes that aren't in most people's wheelhouse. Yeah. One of the big reasons why a lot of people struggle with his universe is because it's so fractured. Because it wasn't yes. just him. He basically set the stage for one of the greatest adventures ever. Because for every sure, yeah. everyone, anyone can pick up a, a pen or a keyboard and start writing an H.P. Lovecraft book, right? Based in his universe. And if you're a fan of H.P. Lovecraft, that book will almost guaranteed be incorporated into the universe. Like H.P. Lovecraft yeah, fans sure. is going to take your book and they're going to incorporate it into the mythos that is the H.P. Lovecraft universe. So that's why it's so difficult. There's plenty of authors that have all contributed to the mythos over time. Anyways, if we had, he would have been replaced immediately. It continues. <laughs> As you requested, I have not shared these writings with other members of the cartel. There is no need for them to be burdened by the depths of Alfirim's delusions. Now, this is where we get into a bit of a... How do we put it? So gatekeeping in terms of information, censorship, um, yeah. they say that they didn't want to burden them, but is it more a case of they didn't want to reveal the truth? Well, then you get into real world instances of the same thing. I mean, the Vatican keep their heretical texts under lock and key, right? Yeah. And uh, this kind of seems like a very similar thing. It's yeah. far too structured to be accurate. But the reason I'm focusing on this before people think, wait, where's the speculation? There's a book that's coming out very soon that is uh, written by the brokers, the Grimoire of the Shadowlands. Now, if these cartels are as religious in their thinking and almost strict in their application to very specific dogma then it throws everything that we can learn about the grimoire of the shadowlands in turmoil yeah because then we have to constantly read the grimoire of the shadowlands thinking to ourselves is this actually the truth or is this the truth as seen through your religious lens right whatever that lens may be exactly and that would be a great point for us to go through and i'm sure we will oh, is yeah. to compare the common points between the two books and usually when you have two distinct separate agencies coming to the same conclusion mm -hmm. usually that conclusion is going to be the right one yeah so hopefully blizzard uh and i do give a lot of credit to blizzard to be able to do this and i do hope mm -hmm. that it does um yeah. because with denusa being a, a very big input into the grimoire of the shadowlands book it's gonna be nice. hopefully very lore accurate and there is a map just gonna say that there's a fucking map <laughs> in the i'm book. gonna apologize to lx now for that one <laughs> Our mission remains focused on following the path of the first ones and securing their secrets. Now, here's something that I wanted to sort of highlight. Our mission remains focused on following the path of the first ones and securing their secrets. This could either be viewed as a literal path, right? Yeah. yeah. Or a path in as, so for example, in religious terms, 
the path of the prophet. In other words, working in the prophet's shoes, walking in the prophet's shoes, doing as the prophet does, whoever your prophet may be or whoever, you know, your religious figures may be. Yeah, the difference between like physical journey and like emotional, spiritual journey. I don't know. I, I, I hope we don't actually see the first ones for a long time. If this is the physical one, because here's the thing. This journal that we've been reading, I got something wrong last week. The journal that we've been reading, this lore book that we've been reading, is actually on their way to the sepulcher. They've not found yes. the sepulcher yet. They're still, they're, they're sort of at some kind of monument or landmark that has these runes of the first ones. And they're hoping that these runes can lead them to the sepulcher of the first ones so that they can ultimately yeah. discover their secrets, right? Let's imagine for a second that we are talking about a physical, literal path. This is the path that the first ones walked when they first arrived in our universe. What does that path look like? And why did they walk it? And could it be that the first ones are indeed dead? So that the sepulcher of the first ones truly is, after they created everything, they walked this path throughout creation, and they finally died and they were buried there with all of their secrets. I mean, this is getting a little bit Transformers for me, to be fair, for that one. Um, I mean, it is obviously a possibility that they kind of made this pilgrimage through yeah. their creations, assuming they had finished their grand design, their work, uh, and then just like laid down and died. But that would just be disappointing because obviously it didn't it didn't work. So for some some force that is. Mm -hmm hell-bent on creating something new or came out of creating something new and were yeah. working within it. Why would you ever stop when there's something new to do? That doesn't make sense to me. Well, it could also be less died and more gone to sleep. So in other words, for example, in Christianity, we have God created the earth in seven days and on the seventh day, he rested. And most common health beliefs is that God is still in his state of rest. So God is still effectively sleeping after creating the universe because everything was perfect and therefore he was no longer needed to interfere with the goings on of the universe right because it was all working as intended now we could say that this is exactly what the first ones are they created the universe not in seven days but they did create the universe and then as a result of that once everything had worked they took a walk through the universe to their final resting place or their resting place until such time that they is once that they are once again required to wake up now of course this is all speculation there's literally no evidence yeah. of this because it could also just be that the sepulcher is where their knowledge is so it's something that they built where they buried all of their secrets because it's not just people that can be buried you can bury secrets as well right yeah exactly so yeah, that, that's sort of just, I, I wanted to point that out just before we continue. It shall be seen whether the information leading to the sepulchre proves to be of tangible value, but we will of course be diligent in our investigation. Alfirim's replacement has already proposed an alternate, alternate method of translation that she assures me will yield favorable results. Venari, welcome back to the story. Oh, that Venari, hey? Eh? What? Uh, yeah. Here's such, where, a, such a revelation that she'll be shady, yeah. Here's my thinking on this. It's clear that where, wherever the path took them, it definitely took them to the mall. If, of course, we argue that this is Venari, Remember, Venari did not arrive in the mall alone. She arrived with her expedition. She was with, and she actually tells us this. We are actually asked to go kill uh, some of the surviving members of her expedition. Or to not help yep. them. So Venari arrived with a bunch of people. Then they learned that in the mall, it's better if you're alone. Traveling in groups can be very dangerous in the mall. <laughs> Wherever that path was, so wherever this journal was written from, those ruins or whatever, it ultimately led them to the moor. So the moor is a stepping stone to the sepulchre. Is that correct or do you disagree Possibly. with that? There, there are others that are searching for the same, same knowledge, right? So why would yes. you not go ask them? Well, it does appear as if these cartels all work with their own thing. 
Not entirely what I meant. Uh, not into broker politics, but there are uh -huh. other beings and entities outside of the brokers that are also looking for the way to the sepulchre of the first ones. So yeah. why would you not try and gain information from them? Maybe you can't ask them directly, but that doesn't mean you can't siphon off information uh, through maybe souls that uh, yeah. are given weekly uh, to go get and rescue that may give some information as they get caught. <laughs> Basically, what you're saying is be close enough to the one entity that is probably of the knowledge of where the sepulchre is in the hopes that you can get... Because it doesn't appear as if Zuval doesn't know where the sepulchre is. According to the Primus, he must not be allowed to reach the sepulchre. But at no point does it state that the Primus or Zuval or maybe any of the other Eternal Ones don't know where it is. They, they know where it is. Yeah, I think they do, or at least have an idea. Yeah. Now, just in case, because people in chat are sort of pointing out that uh, this uh, Alfirum and Venari would not have been of the same uh, sort of cartel. At the end of the day, they're scribes. So it's not impossible that the, the AR cartel picked up uh, the scribe from the VE or... At least in terms of if you look at their names, it seems to be the, the first two letters of the cartel and then their actual name. Uh, from the V cartel, if they needed another scribe that was intelligent enough to actually gain this knowledge, they could have picked up someone from a different cartel. Um, there's also no actual evidence that suggests that the, cart or that the expedition only belongs to the AR cartel. Right. It could be a joint effort for yeah. sure, um, because it's nothing to do with the other like trade commercial responsibilities that the brokers have. Yes. So in this pursuit, they may have you know banded together, teamed up. Uh, yeah. It may just be a deception. Maybe Venari is not her actual name, and it's actually Al Nari. Maybe it's true. not the case. Probably not the case. But no, you don't know why this expedition had gone out and you don't actually know why it failed you know what you've been told yes what venari wanted us to know at to be exactly. fair exactly all right so method of translation that she assures me will yield favorable results and i am confident our venture will yet prove profitable considering that the secrecy of our mission demands our work be conducted at a slow careful pace progress is encouraging the defensive matrix encoded into the artifacts we've discovered remains our primary obstacle i am pleased that no additional losses have been incurred since the last reported incident which i still insist could have been avoided if alfurum had focused his work on disabling the defenses instead of trying to justify his own delusions it sort of gives me throwbacks to some of the engines and machines and, and and structures that the titans left on azeroth for sure they all have their own defense matrix matrices and things to keep unwanted guests out right yeah very titan-esque the broker um boss in nathria and the tassavesh dungeon where they're messing around with artifacts as well we see what happens when they break through that defensive matrix and they yeah. actually get to playing with these big powerful toys yeah. so I don't know. I don't think I want them to be able to break through it. <laughs> the the brokers are becoming scarier and scarier. I will just say this. For a time, I actually trusted the brokers because I trust any being that sort of favors the scientific method, right? So a being that's only in it for the sake of information and nothing but the information, I trust. Now we are getting to a point, do I trust the brokers more than the titans? Absolutely. More than the eternal ones? Definitely. Do I trust the brokers? No. I, I don't trust Depends them. on the titan for me, uh, for sure. Like The titans mm. as a whole, don't trust them. The pantheon, don't trust them. Specific titans, I trust certain titans more than I would trust any broker. We could probably argue about that. I don't think any of the Titans is to be trusted, but, you know, be that as it may. Unfortunately, no further evidence has been found as to the whereabouts of the criminal himself, nor those who made the unwise decision to join his doomed expedition. Let us hope that our operatives in Oribos find a solid lead that allows justice to be done. Yours in faithful service, Executor, Al-Hatar.
or your executor. I, I'm assuming that's what. Yeah, yeah. That's what I, not executor, but executor. So he's gone from being a heretic to being delusional, but also being sort of dangerous, to now being a criminal in four pages. I mean, that sounds like every religious figure ever, right? Like yeah. any prophet, anyone who's ever come close to experiencing a truth in big quotation marks they will always get labeled as a heretic because it's not the same truth that they've been raised with yeah. and anybody who changes their mind based on any information will always be persecuted as delusional wrong or dangerous if they start acting on it yeah as someone as someone said i think it was brett weinstein earlier in the week i was watching a, a, a podcast with him and he sort of said that every single truth that we hold today as absolutely true one started as a conspiracy theory yeah right exactly um so at the end of the day what is truth well truth isn't always obvious until such time that it reveals itself to be true the brokers clearly don't like that they they have their own belief system and that belief system is very important to them i just quickly wanted to say one final thing here this sort of suggests that one of two things is going to happen somewhere along the line now, I don't know exactly where this will happen, but somewhere along the line, something's going to happen. We are going to either learn that Venari is not who she says she is, and she is not to be trusted, and Alfirum may, in fact, interject himself to steal us away from her, or Blizzard will put us on the path of hunting down Alfirum and his benefactors. The question I have is, which one do you want more? So, I believe, and this is just an intuition, but I do believe I know what's going to happen with the Venari story, and it's going to be disappointing, simply because they're trying to tie it into another storyline happening in Shadowlands that should be unrelated, but isn't. Okay. Um, because something that we were talking about earlier is that they've got like 10 bullet points, and they're all trying to mash it into one. But... I don't know. Again, it's kind of jumping the shark. Uh, if you reveal too much mystery, then you lose the the pull. So to ever catch up with this heretic Alafrum, like mm -hmm. I, I don't want to know because if they're just going to tell you the truth, it's like oh yeah, exposition. Yeah. Well, well there's no fun. Like, what are we gonna? What are we gonna? think about now we've been given the answer there's no speculation we know the truth well we can learn more things right the <laughs> fact that there's so many in my chat that goes venari is mommy and venari is hot Oof. is sort of weird guys it is weird um just wait until she turns into a dreadlord then you're gonna get all the fucking vampire mommy memes coming out <laughs> i mean it might actually fucking do so we'll we'll have to see but okay, so on to what is actually uh, the speculation bit of this. This is the final page of the journal. The one that we did not have at the time of going through the journal the first time. The nature of the six, possibly seven, possibly infinite. Among the superstitions conveyed to me by Irak II, superstitions I, of course, dismissed as the fanciful mythos of an uncivilized culture, one lingered within my mind. For you see, it takes a truly exceptional intellect to transcend what one is taught and retaught by so-called scholars open to only a narrow possibility. Irak II spoke of a thousand truths which I at first took as a sign of scattered indecision. I mean, everyone oh, here please. immediately knows what that relates to, right? And I'm disappointed. Why? Uh, I mean, it's something we spoke about last week anyway, with um, Eric II being a possible Klaxi and having the void relation as it was brought up in the other ones as well. Yeah. But I don't know. Like, it just seems to go back on things they've set up and things that they were leaning heavily towards and there still are in certain aspects but mm -hmm. it's almost like you've got two teams writing at the same time and they're writing different stories going in different directions and this is just pulling away from where we have been going and it's mm -hmm. it's very jarring i sort of like it and the reason i like it is it highlights the incredible 
almost mo monumental, almost impossible task of trying to decipher these runes. So it's contradicting itself at every single turn, which is, if you were to consider something so much larger than ourselves, their intellect would be nearly impossible for us to comprehend, right? If you're Possibly. trying to understand what the first ones are saying, there is a very real chance that you will have zero chance of doing it. Like, your chances of actually being able to understand the first ones would be extremely limited. So that's sort of why I like it, because I'm reading it in that context where he's sort of speaking and then sort of changes his mind, but then also sort of completely goes against what he said before, because the runes, and it becomes apparent in the next page, keeps shifting things around. Yeah. But, okay, let's go to the next page. But the key to interpreting the writings of the first ones lay in setting aside what I had believed and accepting a greater reality beyond it. Suddenly, I perceived the pattern and its fractals, not as one truth, but as layers of intersecting truths. A thousand truths. That's what I said, not what the book says. A thousand yeah. truths. So the first ones also held true to the idea that there is no singular truth. But rather the truth itself is an intersecting layer of truth. So it's layers all the way down and truth upon truth going in every direction. Does this mean that the old gods really are the only ones that see the vision of the first ones that still live by the vision of the first ones because here's my problem the first ones created this universe for a very specific purpose yeah. they themselves do not hold to an individual truth and yet the two beings that or the two structures that they design that's meant to defend or keep the universe in balance are focused on singular truths for the Eternal Ones, it is the purpose. For the Titans, it's something akin to the purpose, although we've not learned enough about them to know what guides them. But they do well, seem the order, to be... order, right? Order, uh, although even in that... No order is in capital yeah. O, force. The order is yeah, in yeah. the ordering, which would be their version of the purpose. Yeah, but they, they seem to also be very one-dimensional in only following a very narrow path whenever it comes to how things are interpreted. Why would beings that believes in a litany of truths, that believe in, in any possible path being the correct path, why would those beings create their mirrors in many ways, their constructs, if you will, in a very one-dimensional way? Well, this is where you get into a conversation between what truth is it that they're referring to um because depending on how you look at it the way that the like alternate timelines has been described since they're all happening simultaneously and they are all real yeah they would be the thousand truths happening simultaneously and any one of them could be the path that goes forwards you just have to shift your reality to be that one mm -hmm. but then you get into the question of who is right are they all happening and are they all true and are they all separate branches yeah. and separate lines or is it like the titans believe that there is one true timeline Mm -hmm. um, I mean, as many as one just pointed out, and as often Zalasath do talk about a true path as well. So why would they be distinctly separate from the rest of the thousand truth believing void? It's an interesting point. One that I can't necessarily argue with. Although true path and a thousand truths are not necessarily, it doesn't have to be adversarial, right? It doesn't have to be mutually exclusive. The way I see it, at least when it comes to the old gods, is... They do believe in a true path. They believe that there are a thousand different ways of achieving the true path or of walking the true path. So basically, the, the theory of all paths lead to heaven, right? Yeah, yeah. Whereas the light, for example, believes in a singular path and that all other paths would lead you astray. 
it would not lead you to the one true path. Yeah, and this is something I've actually seen a lot of times when this kind of conversation comes up. Um, the whole, the void sees a thousand truths and the light only sees one. They don't only, that doesn't necessarily mean they only see one. They only believe in one. They only follow yeah. one. That doesn't mean they don't see the rest of it as well. They only just accept one as their reality. Yeah. yeah. Same as Amonthul has done. Same as the bronze dragons have done under Amonthul. Um, they are set to kind of help protect the singular pathway they chose, but they do see yeah. all of them. Oh, yeah. All right. So, continuing. Just as we, from our first moment of consciousness, know that death is the foundation of all existence, so there are beings whose nature is fundamentally different from our own. In other words, beings for whom death is not the fundamental uh, foundation of all existence. Now, the question that I have here, and I don't necessarily have a, a, a real answer to it, it's just a question at this point. We could argue that he's talking about the Titans and the Eternal Ones, because for them, death is not an absolute, right? It's not a foundation. They will not die. They will live forever. Unless, of course, someone kills them, but that's a whole different discussion. Yeah. Are you immortal? Well, yes, if you can't die of old age, you are immortal. If you can still die by car crash, that doesn't mean you're not immortal. It just means that you are also um, killable, so to speak. Yeah, there right? is a very big difference between immortal and invincible. Yes. Uh, they are very different things. Uh, one is you will live forever. Uh, you will unlikely be the one aging, or at least aging at a very declined rate. Uh, yeah. One is an unattainable fucking horse that will not drop for me. Yeah, I've never had that horse either. Um, <laughs> so... I feel the pain. But all right, so they could also be talking about us. Because yeah, very true. for us, mortals in the living realm... Now, keep in mind that based on the previous pages we read, the brokers are not familiar with reality. They have no access to our side of the veil. They are on this side of the veil. They, they were born, so to speak, inside the great beyond. Not the great beyond, the in-between. So they have no knowledge of what goes on. This is why they're sort of trying to talk to souls that move through Orobos because they want to learn about our side, what goes on on our side. Yeah. So for us, if you think about how mortals live, death is not the foundation of our existence. Life is the foundation of our existence. More importantly, hope could be the foundation of our existence. The hope for a brighter tomorrow. The hope for tomorrow. From the earliest moments of our first breath, hope is what drives us so to the first part i mean it is death that still drives the mortal reality on azeroth mm -hmm. uh with the curse of flesh with souls ancestors with um even the drenor natives or at least satians sapient species mm -hmm. um including the drenai in this even though i know drenor is not their home world even though they're arrogant enough to just rename it as theirs they all kind of put emphasis on the dead the souls mm -hmm. dying the curse of flesh mm -hmm. uh so death is very much a driving force for our reality yeah but is it is, is it a foundation because it could be a drive but it doesn't necessarily have to be the foundation of our existence whereas if you are a being in the shadowlands death is your existence without death you would not have an existence arguably from what we've seen in the shadowlands it has very mm -hmm. little to do with death i mean it's mostly about rebirth and kind of staving off that final oh, yeah. step shadowlands itself is more limbo than an afterlife oh i yeah, know i want to agree with you i'm just saying if you were born in the Shadowlands, like the brokers seemingly were, you would at least have, well, not in the Shadowlands, but in the in-between, you would never have tasted life. Because life wasn't you. You weren't born into life. You were born into the other side of it, right? So you have no idea what goes on within life, within the realms of life. So it was just sort of an interesting distinction there, or an interesting sort of... Uh, pause it there i guess you could say anyways page number three imagine then based upon the truths i have told you that each of these rival forces could and i stress could for the fractals may yet reveal another path be embodied by a host of transcendent beings 
as powerful as our own eternal ones. Now that is that is huge because it confirms Possibly. something that we have believed for a long time, but it also confirms something or deny something or disprove something that we have changed our minds on. Because for a long time, we did think if there is a pantheon of order, then it stands to reason that there must be a pantheon of life. There must be a pantheon of light. There must be a pantheon of, of disorder. There must be a pantheon of death. And therefore, there must be a pantheon of void. And then we sort of went, but that's too many pantheons, too many titans. It's sort of convoluted. There's, there's another problem there. Whenever you go to disorder, if there is a pantheon in disorder, then how? Because the pantheon is meant to create order. But if there's disorder yeah. and it's the... <laughs> The, the universe how are you going to have a committee of chaos? Like? Yeah, how, how are you going to have a bunch of lords of chaos coming together and sort of agreeing on what's the best steps for chaos to take from here on moving forward without everyone just going their own fucking direction? And I give you the party conventions for the libertarians where <laughs> people are start trying to have actual conversations and there's one guy running around naked, right? Um, I was just going to say, it's absolute like, fucking chaos. <laughs> can you imagine the Joker crazy as he is sitting down in a boardroom going i have the spreadsheet sir this is our projected chaos rating for the month <laughs> like no it doesn't work <laughs> no uh, what you could have just to be clear to or be fair to the other side what you could absolutely have is lords of chaos that sort of each go their own way with their own faction within the realms of chaos right that is I mean, entirely now we're possible. just traversing into Warhammer lore and... Oh boy, I would love to see you dive into that universe. You would absolutely lose your shit. True. Uh, it is on my bucket list of things to do. But <laughs> I do want to stress just... It will be your just... bucket. Like, it, is, it will be what kills you. <laughs> I do want to say, though, be, be very clear that he himself says, could, and I stress could... So his argument here is that based on everything that he's seen so far, there is the possibility, a strong possibility, but a possibility nonetheless, that every single one of these powerful forces, in other words, the six forces that have, that is one, but that could also possibly be seven, that each one of those forces has its own branch of the Eternal Ones. Now, we already know that he is correct. How do we know this? Titans. So he's at least one out of six or five, depending on whether yeah. there's six forces or seven, right? So, so he's, he's at least one out of five or one out of six. Or at least one out of two, anyway. Uh, but I did, I did my usual ghetto paintwork with uh, some stuff the other day that I dropped into Discord. And I know uh, many as well, and yeah. Ziang were there as well. I don't know if you've seen the mm -hmm. spaghetti paintwork I did, but... Uh, no, I don't think I it have. It does lean towards a very philosophical discussion rather than an actual gameplay point of view. But yeah. there is the question of thing and nothing, space, empty space. Uh, and yeah. that's the kind of question that comes into play here is, uh, is it one? Is it six? Is it 13? Uh, I And then yeah. you've got the inverse as well, the reflected side. So... There's a lot of things that could be argued here that he's got the base point, but then has, in essence, misread the deviation in the fractal. So here's what I would do with this entire thing. I would lose the idea of six or even seven. I would lose that idea entirely. And I would look, as I said last week, at the six or the seven as the three in one, the Holy Trinity in, uh, in Christianity. Yeah, yeah. Even though it is three different entities they all form part of a singular entity they are all god so i would look at the six possible seven rather than looking at them as individual forces instead look at them as a singular force the force of the first ones yeah so for this call them the first ones that's our first force and every single one of the cosmological forces can sort of be seen as elements of their personalities so uh, they have a little bit of chaos in them they have a little bit of order they have life they have death they have light they have void uh so th this gives us not personalities as in we would see personalities yeah. but the closest thing that you could sort of describe it as right um that's sort of how i would look at it so 
he's describing what he sees as the one, the the creation, the being that that led or sort of led the charge in creating yeah. uh, our universe. Um, yeah. So let me just DM you these images, and you can pop them up on the stream if you want. Um, but they are very spaghetti paintwork. So don't don't judge me on this right. shit. So yeah, that was that was the first one I did, um, and. Mm -hmm. That would be the evidence of the cosmological map from uh, Chronicles turning into the fractal that we now understand it to to try and represent, or at least a portion of that cosmic fractal. Um, mm -hmm. You then have the pink part, which is actually unfilled on the Cosmo map that we know, um, but that would be the merging of different forces, right? And with what we know from the earlier yeah. pages, that would be arguably where the first ones have put their their little nudge in there so to speak right to to guide it in yes. certain ways um mm -hmm. so that would be the six forces as you can see and then the seventh being that guiding force that combination that gap in between that's being filled uh so from okay. a singular point flowing outward you see the pattern going into a fractal that would inevitably in an infinitely repeating pattern come back with the same kind of fraction again right later on it would eventually yeah. repeat itself now the okay. second part i see what you're saying this yeah. is not an onion uh but it looks like an onion because they did it in paint and it's spaghetti as shit um but if you take <laughs> that first image as the black line so all of that in its infinitely repeating pattern going around is the black line that is present that is there mm -hmm. that is reality that is the one that is six that is seven that we know and we live in you then also have the white space mm -hmm. the empty space in between the negative space yeah well that would be the other that is also mentioned so that would mean that from a mm -hmm. singular point you then get two the there and the not there but then if that also yeah. follows the same split you're now actually running at 13 forces because you have the one that is now two, that there and not there, each of them splitting into six, so that's 12 for a total, with the pattern itself yeah. being the, seven, uh, the 13th, uh, which is, funnily enough, another powerful number that gets mentioned quite often when talking about cosmic geometry, so to speak. Yeah. So it doesn't have to be 13. It could just be seven, right? The pattern doesn't have to be a force in and of itself, but rather a creation of one of the forces, so thereby subservient to the creation uh, or yeah. to the creators of said creation. And also, the not there, so the force that is not represented within the universe, could also be um, incapable of splitting itself because it was not included in the original creation. And therefore, it is still whole. Quite possibly. It is not split. Uh, the right? other option would be the person who is drawing this fractal or creating the pattern would be that outside extra seventh force, right? The one that is guiding it or yeah. making the clock, so to speak. It's entirely possible. Absolutely. Continuing, I have but scratched much like us. I have but scratched the barest <laughs> surface of the truths that point me ever closer to the sepulchre, and I will devote my every moment to discovering its location, uh, writ as written by Akalon uh, on this, the 27th day of the sixth month, 2021. Um, <laughs> because this is literally me. <laughs> I have but scratched the barest surface of yeah. uh, the truths, uh, but I am devoted to fucking discovering all of it. Um, all right, page number four. A few final questions for your consideration, dear reader. What if, again, this still purely speculative, the mortal plane is not some distant corner of reality that the first ones created to supply us with souls and anima? What if it is the very nexus of existence, where death is but one of many great powers that holds sway? Which we sort of know to be true because while yeah. death does have sway in our universe so does disorder so does order so does void so does light uh, so does life 
They, they all influence us in very different ways, and they all have the ability to sort of rock us about, if needs be. So he is sort of positing our universe at this point, and it just, I think, is sort of included to ensure that we understand the brokers are incapable of coming to reality. That they can't be in our universe. Well, they've definitely been shown to be able to take from our universe, but how they manage to do so is still in question. Um, whether it's just they steal from the soul stream of souls that are coming in, uh, yeah. but that also then raises further questions of how they got demons, how they got oh, yeah. uh, Naru and stuff in the Theater of Pain. Uh, so it does seem that something <laughs> something's not quite right. Uh, there's there's an illusion and they're hiding something. I mean, just because they can't, so demons doesn't have to necessarily come from reality, right? Well, that gets into another speculation that we've had for quite some time that the in between is actually the nether. Uh, and the nether is under the a different name. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the in between, in my mind, is the realm that links all cosmic realms together. Every cosmic force just has a different word for what they consider to be the in-between so we know that like the you demons call it nightmare i call it thros you call yes. it nether i call it in between you call it chorgast i call it why blizzard why <laughs> <laughs> the one issue though with that argument and this is the problem that you and i have run into whenever we do posit this is the time difference Time in the Twisting Nether is notably different. If this expansion took place in the Twisting Nether, at this point in time, thousands of years would have passed already in the Twisting Nether with almost no time passing in reality. Because the Twisting Nether's time is... Is it faster? I get confused. Yes, it moves faster in the Twisting Nether than what it moves. Actually goes different ways depending on where you are and how long you've spent in there. But I mean, it's been nine months or eight months and we've got two weeks of content. So I say we are in the Nether. <laughs> well, okay, we could be in the Nether. I I, I, I will accept that, that hypothesis for now. <laughs> um, <laughs> But at the end of the day, the Twisting Nether, uh, and for those of you that don't know where I'm coming at this, in uh, the audio drama A Thousand Years of War, uh, they, they are sort of, it's explained why Sargeras is so much further ahead than anyone else. By being in the Twisting Nether, Sargeras can take thousands of years to plan his invasion of a specific planet, whereas that planet would have 15 minutes to basically plan to stop him. Like, by the time he decides to attack, he's had thousands of years to order his attack, whereas that planet had no time to set up defenses or to stop him from doing it. So we know that time is different in the Twisting Nether. We also know that time is not different in the Shadowlands. It's just perceived different, but it's not different. A day in the Shadowlands yeah. is still a day on Azeroth. Like, 24 hours is 24 hours, and that, that it doesn't move differently. It's just not perceived the same. Yeah, and the argument there would be that the Shadowlands is outside of the in-between, right? It is actually its realm. You have to travel through the in-between to get there, so it's yeah. not actually inside the nether, so it's not under that time yes. wibbly-wobbly fuckery. Yes, so basically what we would then argue is that the in-between is quite literally specifically named. It is the in-between. It's the space in-between the different cosmological forces. So moving in the in-between, one could move from the Shadowlands to the Twisting Nether, the realm of the demons, because both of them is located in the in-between, but they're not part of the in-between. They're simply located in it. So that would be probably the best way of describing it. What if, again, this is still purely speculative, the mortal plane is not some distant corner of reality that the first ones created to supply us with souls and anima. Who's the us that he's referring to? Yeah, that is a bit of a question because brokers may deal in anima, but they don't seem to consume it. No. So why, why would they be out there farming it? 
to be fair. We do know that they have spoken to beings in the Shadowlands at length. We know that they've yeah. spoken to servants of the Eternal Ones at length. So his view is shaped by what the first ones believe, or the Eternal Ones rather believe. So the Eternal Ones view us as simply the supply chain or the source that forms part of the supply chain. They don't view us as anything more than that. We are not really important to them. What we are is a yeah. supply battery. And that's it. According to his findings, though, it would seem like, actually, no. We are completely different to them. We are separate to what they are. This is basically what these entire pages signify. Is, listen to his, his, his posture the mortal plane is not some distant corner of reality that the first ones created to supply us with souls and anima. So in other words, we are not just a tool for them. What if we are completely different to them? So we are our own thing, so to speak. Yeah, I mean, he does posit that in the earlier pages that we were just kind of a fungus that happened to grow out of this fractal, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. Continuing to patch fi page five here. If true, that what would this say of mortal souls and their potential? And if the six or seven, or excuse my imprecision, each vie with one another to claim it, could they be driven by the unconscious knowledge that there exists some other force outside our understanding that seeks it as well? So that would be the Twilight Zone episode, right? That we are all of our existence is in a petri dish that is just under the scrutiny of a scientist in a lab right yeah uh, what would happen to our universe if we saw the scientist if we could communicate with that scientist right uh -huh. it would absolutely destroy everything we know yeah. so maybe that's the fundamental truth that has been discovered by so many villains or heroes turned villains they have managed to see evidence of the scientist <laughs> peering down at us and well they want to break out the petri dish <laughs> here's my speculation on this i'll read it again just to refresh and if the six or seven or and he was obviously going to say infinite because he doesn't actually know the the the, yeah. the the runes don't make sense it doesn't give him an exact number it seems to change the whole time excuse my imprecision he asks each vie with one another to claim it so in other words according to the 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 runes that he's reading these six cosmological forces seems to be in a battle with one another to claim our souls and our anima that's what they want so this gives us a possible explanation for why we are so important to the cosmological forces. Why did the Void send their own beings into our universe? Why is the light constantly marching on our world? Why is the Twisting Nether constantly working? Why are the Titans constantly working? Because all of them want control of the supply chain. They want the anima. Yeah. They, they want the control. Which is something that we sort of speculated on um, right at the beginning of the Shadowlands. Uh, I would yes, say yeah. right about January, February, we started talking about the possibility that Death won and now has claimed control of the, what can only be described as limitless power that is the anima <laughs> and our souls, but that the others are not done. This might yeah, also... I mean... Sorry, yeah? As soon as we found out what anima was in the reveal, we went mad speculating that anima is mojo uh, yeah. to the trolls or spirit, uh, like Azeroth eats, yes. under a different name. I mean, it is the soul, it is the energy of creation, it yes. is the energy of existence. And if every force is after it for their own ends, well, then we get Naru farming it up with worship. We mm -hmm. get the Emerald Dream farming it up with rebirth and growth, and yes. things like that. We also get Disorder farming it with their soul engines and mm -hmm. fell and actually consuming it. Same with Order, do it in a way with the arcane ley lines being spirit of a titan or their anima. Yeah. Which, funnily enough, we've been siphoning since we fucking discovered it. And mm -hmm. boom, we've been we've been using the anima without even knowing it. 
Yeah. So, yeah. But the the funny thing for me here is this would also explain why in Bastion we are told that the light and the void are trifling powers because they currently do not have access to this power. So if the light and the void were to attack the Shadowlands, they would meet a swift end because they don't have control of the incredible power that that the death realm currently wields this power has hopped hyped them up to the point where they can basically do whatever the fuck they want the other powers have no ability to intervene because they don't have access to our to our power here's where things get really spooky like spooky as fuck could they be driven by the unconscious knowledge that there exists some other force outside our understanding that seeks it as well this is the other remember in the first pages that we yeah. covered he spoke about the six could possibly be one but then there's another that's not part of the six nor part of the one but stands outside of them all so a different yeah. power that also covets what the six have sort of been gorging on for themselves this so is this is where we go back to the onion picture like it, yeah. it would be the negative space right the yes. empty space the opposite the mirror version yeah which there are many ways that we can actually see this in place already in the story but i am interested to see where blizzard will take this cosmic duality going forwards you see i believe that he's 100 percent correct i've asked this question last night in discord i asked you guys this question who is Zuval working for? Well, that, that's still in question, isn't it? Is he working for himself or is he working for the entity of death with a capital D? Uh, we, we don't know at this point. I mean, he could be trying to release death for himself. He may mm -hmm. be death itself. Yeah. We, it's still left ambiguous at this stage. So his master or somebody he is working for is unknown. So here's my posit, here's my theory, my hypothesis. If we believe that the first ones is the gr is group one, the group that splits into six, that forms the creation of the universe, but they are called the first ones, the ones who created the universe, then it stands to reason that they would be considered life because they were the ones who breathed life into the universe, either by creating the cosmological forces or by subjugating them by forcing them to start working together yeah. but without them life would not have been bred into the universe there would have been no life because these forces at least according to the earlier pages of the journal they were in continuous flux so whatever did get created would as soon as it was created be destroyed by one of the others because it was continuously just a, a tugging war for control so these these first ones that I would like to change their name and say the life bringers brought life into the universe. I swear to God, if you name the others as shadow bringers, that's it. No, We're no, no, done. no. They are <laughs> no, no. I'm using very specific names here: the life bringers and the death bringers. So the group, the other, they are death. And the reason I asked this last night in chat as well in Discord as well: where is death? in our universe it's chained bro it's uh it's nowhere to be found it's the mcu death is a revolving door at but the moment we all agree in chat you can sort of uh throw in here as well we all agree that death is not in our universe the shadowlands is not death is there anyone that disagrees with that is there anyone that that can make an argument tangible argument that the Shadowlands is death. Because the Shadowlands has nothing to do with death. Death is supposed to be the finality. It's the final moment. It's it's after that there can be nothing more. The Shadowlands is clearly not that. The Shadowlands is more about rebirth than what it seems to be about death. So it goes back to that closed loop system. I mean, what better way to try and keep hold of the anima? and the power mm -hmm. the currency of the universe uh, and all of creation than to put it into a basically a cleaning loop it goes in it gets washed of its sins and it gets returned mm -hmm. okay but now remember if you go back to what we 
saw on page four. What if, again, this this still purely speculative, the mortal plane is not some distant corner of our of reality that the first ones created to supply us? The the brokers are native to the Shadowlands. They're native to this in-between world that they find themselves in. Meaning that this yeah. world wasn't meant as a place for souls to go. This this world created its own life. That's why the brokers are there. They exist because this world clearly does have the ability to create its own beings. Be those beings of life, be those beings of death. They are beings. The brokers are very much by all our matrix alive. Yeah. And yet somehow our souls now end up in the Shadowlands. Now, the theory that I'm coming up with here, the theory that I'm sharing with you, is to say our souls were never meant to go to one of the six cosmological forces. Our souls were meant to go to the other. The idea, yeah. the original idea, was that life would be born between the six. But that's where it's sort of um rain ends the second a soul dies death gets to claim it but death was excluded from the argument death was excluded from the creation it explains why zuval went on his rampage why zuval is doing what he's doing because if if he's not serving some bigger force in the universe something bigger than the first ones because he's hunting for the secrets of the first ones if he's not serving something bigger then what's he doing a child fighting against his parents for no reason other than just to fight his parents i mean hello sargeras right <laughs> well sargeras did what he did because he was afraid of the of the void lords Right? He to was, an extent, yes. He was convinced that the Void Lords would kill or corrupt everything. He also was blind to other ways. Uh, he didn't trust the Titans to be able to fix the corruption, so to speak. So he kind of yeah. went on his big crusade. Um, but I don't know. It seems that to then have somebody masterminding Zoval's kind of actions currently, it would be kind of diminishing to the Shadowlands story, it would kind of render it completely null and void. Um, but if not you were to because... look at what he's done Sorry, yeah? with Corthia launching harpoons into the into the in-between and pulling this landmass out of nowhere, yeah. would this not be something that could also have been done for our reality anyway? Uh, kind of finding a different version of Corthia or a Corthia esque type landmass and making that the dream and another one for the Shadowlands to then stop this anima, this currency, this power from leaking the fractal, from leaking the design. It's possible. I mean, at this point, everything is possible, right? And it's all speculation, it's all theories because. Well, this is lore that I don't even think the Grimmer of the Shadowlands is necessarily going to cover. <laughs> Probably not. Um, th th this is lore that, that sort of... These things are only going to become extremely relevant to us probably two, three expansions from now. Is when we'll look back at these journals and we'll be like, oh my god, do you remember when we fucking read this? Yeah. Now <laughs> it makes sense. Now we get it. Pretty much. Um, but to me, it does explain... If there is a more powerful force that has gained the trust of someone like Zuval and have explained to Zuval, much like Zuval explained to Sargeras, because without Sargeras, Zuval wouldn't have been able to do what he's been doing. Much like this with Zuval, this outside force explained to Zuval what has been happening and what the first ones have done. He has decided, fuck you, I will serve death i will serve the the death force the death bringers instead um because the first ones are a bunch of liars and i don't i i don't agree with the things that they are doing this also then brings uh, uh, brings about an interesting discussion that we also had last night during the discord discussions uh, about domination magic and that yeah. domination magic itself could belong to the other so it's not even a magic 
that serves a purpose in the first one's reality. It's not their magic. It's, it's a magic that belongs to the other. So a force much more dangerous than um, the Eternal Ones wielding uh, a force that they do not understand. Maybe so. I mean, then that would also raise the question of, is anima a thing that doesn't require a soul? Because before we had the Curse of Flesh and before we were, like, mortal, went into the Shadowlands, etc., etc., to, to die, um, what did they get any anima? Was that a thing? Or did we then create an extra influx through the Curse of Flesh that we were now mortal and could die? Because there were obviously mortal races on other planets before the Curse mm -hmm. of Flesh was introduced. Yeah. Um, unless you take the idea that the Curse of Flesh is something that's been introduced on every planet to create mortal beings. Um, look at the Evergrowth and how orcs became a thing. Yeah. Right? They, they were infused with life to an inanimate titan forged yeah. kind of rock monster um so how would that have worked did, did we create a surge that broke a system did we create the system with the surge did we have any impact whatsoever are we just a drop in the bucket did they even notice so when it comes to that question of mo mortals and the curse of flesh i've always been of the belief that mortals have absolutely existed prior to the Curse of Flesh. Uh, because even on Azeroth, not every single race's existence can be yeah, attributed exactly. to the Curse of Flesh. Uh, the trolls and the night elves come to yes. come to mind. Where there's certainly people that believe that there may have been a Curse of Flesh on a being or a creature uh, that was never mentioned. But that's not really supported in any of the, of the scripture, of the lore. The only support we have is that the trolls eventually became night elves, but that the trolls were almost beast-like, you know, before the influence of the Well of Eternity. So that gave them intelligence, but they were beasts, so to speak, prior to that. So obviously, and there is evidence, at least to some extent, that suggests that animals and beasts would still have anima, right? To an extent, um, yeah. They would probably not have as much as mortals because we already know that the amount of anima that you hold is reliant on your duties and actions whilst alive, right? Yeah. So when you were alive, the more powerful you were, the more anima you would house. You can look at it as an ever-expanding battery. So if you were extremely powerful, your battery would be very large and therefore... Even if you depleted it somewhat, it would grow once again to an incredible amount because the yeah. battery had now the capability of growing that big. Whereas if you were just a, a squirrel, right, you would have a teeny tiny battery that would basically be completely <laughs> fucking null and void the second someone tried to feast on it, right? But at the end of the day, they, they would all still have um, this sort of uh, anima. Uh, the Curse of Flesh, certainly some. And one could make the argument that the reason the old gods provided these beings with the curse of flesh is because of their battle for control over the souls and anima, not allowing the titans the ability to um, create these beings without anima, which they would obviously never benefit from. Instead, yeah. they introduced the curse of flesh, giving them a bigger potential loot that they could walk around, uh, walk away with if they were to win the battle. Um, which, of course, at this point, how are they all trying to fight the battle? Um, the old gods are sending, uh, the void gods are sending the old gods into the into reality with the hope of 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 eventually gaining enough influence and power to, and I do believe this, to corrupt a titan. But the reason they want to corrupt a titan is to send that titan to the realms of death and destroy the supply line so that they can take control of the supply line. The Light is doing something very similar, only with the Army of Light. And in that regard, we've not yet seen what the Light would do on a planet that it completely controlled. Would, would the Light also try to influence the Titan uh, that it had created? So each one of these are sort of trying to vie for power, to, to gain access to the Anima. 
There is a possibility that we have seen the light try to influence a titan before. Uh, with the Tomb of Sargeras, uh, before you get to the Avatar room, there are mm. those light defense matrix that are oh, not yeah. titan-esque. They are definitely Naru-esque, light-esque, and not of titan origin. So, arguably, uh -huh. the light has already been interfering with Azeroth for quite some time, since yeah. that was an ancient night elven temple. Yeah. Uh, and even then, before that, it was a place of significant power. That's why the temple was built there. Yes. So, I think that we have seen some extent of what they've done. Just not as clearly as with the old gods. It's, it's not yes. as on the nose as the old gods. At least currently, yes. anyway. Um, but then we also arguably have had hints or will be getting hints that a titan has already been to the Shadowlands. Yeah. Uh, is also currently residing in the Shadowlands. Yes. And before anybody busts a nut in their pants, it's not Argus. Put your fucking dick down, please. <laughs> So, uh, many of you might be asking, well, why are the Titans not clearly against the system? Uh, that's quite easy. Steve Denuser actually answers this question in an interview that he did, I think it was two months after the launch of Shadowlands. This is a while ago, though, so um, don't quote me on this. If you really want to see the interview, just type in Akalon Steve Denuser interview, it will pop up. In the interview, Steve Denuser explains how the different cosmological forces maintain order within the universe balance as he calls it and he says that if one of the forces is poised to become too powerful if one of the forces sort of threatens the balance of the universe it's not entirely outside the realms of possibility that certain forces may team up in order to bash one down yeah the current status quo is a team up between order and death or at least the death that exists currently in the world the rebirth engine it is uh Ouroboros was created by the titans by order the arbiter is a construct that was placed by the titans to signal the the allegiance that these two sides have to each other this is all speculation by the way could be wrong but the the arbiter seems to resemble the titans far more than she resembles the eternal ones if you look at the literal shadowlands the arbiter doesn't fit into the shadowlands one could make the argument maybe for bastion but it would be far more believable that bastion was sort of created in her image rather than she in the in theirs right definitely influenced by for sure yeah yeah so the Arbiter was created as a way when Order decided to help death, or let's call it the realm of rebirth, to take control of the souls. When they tried to wrest control away from whomever had it at the time, let's say the old gods, maybe the light, when they were trying to wrest control away from this cosmological force, Order said, but hold on, how do we fucking know that you're, you, you're going to play by the rules? And you're going to keep sharing the souls and anima with us. And they said, well, all right, what if you built the city as well as the construct that decides where souls go? And therefore, this construct will always ensure that some of the souls go to Ardenweald, some of them to Revendreth, Maldraxxus, and of course, um, Bastion, but that some of them will also come to you. So she will ensure that you also get a steady flow of anima this is why the titans are more than happy to maintain the status quo because they're also getting fat on the souls and anima that is that exists within reality and then one could make the argument that the titans are actually trying to subvert the system even more by keeping a titan like azeroth asleep refusing uh, refusing that she wakes up and thereby ending their sort of scheme their ponzi scheme if you will I mean, at this point, they're just kind of drip feeding her enough spirit and anima to stay alive, but definitely not enough so that she can power up yeah. and break free of her chains. Exactly. Uh, now, I do want to just point out that all of this is speculation. There's no evidence of it. This is just how when you read the story and you sort of follow the lines, there's a logical explanation for it. 
and this this does fit logically could of course 100 percent be wrong blizzard could take this completely different direction and that would be just as cool yeah. um but onto the last page here so much awaits discovery in the geometry so many truths lie in the intersections the fractals i refuse to lo leave the hunt for the sepulcher until i am proven right until i gaze upon the pattern with my own eyes and all truths are revealed before me yours in service alfurum the devout now this is very interesting because they refer to him as alfurum the heretic yeah he refers to himself as alfurum the devout I mean, that just smells to me like uh, someone's headcanon is actually correct and uh, the, the, the mainstream don't like it. Uh, I wouldn't know anything about what that feels like. <laughs> no, no, who would? Um, <laughs> but no, at, at the end of the day, I'm always reminded of um, when Blizzard finally, finally fucking announced that the Chronicles is in fact not canonical insofar yeah. as the the word of god it's not the gospel it is only told from the perspective of the titans and myself you pyromancer we all basically jumped out of our fucking seats because we've been saying it for literal yeah. years before that and everyone kept saying fuck you fuck you you're wrong this is not what the the chronicle says you're talking bullshit this is what the chronicle says and then finally you go oh my god thank you yeah and then not a single cunt came to say, sorry, no. I was wrong. <laughs> no, of course not. Of course not. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for watching this clip from the Sunday Night Show Show. The Sunday Night Show Show, of course, every Sunday night right here on YouTube, where you can find literally all the lore that you can imagine, all the lore that you can stomach in a single evening. It's a lot of fun. You should definitely come check it out. Of course, to all of the patrons, the Twitch subs, and the YouTube channel members, thanks to you, this channel keeps growing. We literally wouldn't be here without you, so I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. Guys, as always, my name is Akulon, and I will see all of you in the next one. Peace out, fam.